All right, let's pray. <laughs> Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you that we're able to be here um, in your presence and learn about your word, Lord. I thank you for Ellen and the time that she has put into preparing for this week, Father. Um, I thank you for all the things you're preparing our heart to hear this year, Lord, and um, just pray that you can um, continue to till the soil of our souls as we uh, jump into John this week, Father. And I just thank you um, for all the beautiful imagery in this passage today, Lord. Um, yeah, and Father, I just pray that you would speak to each one of us um, where we need to hear about your light and, and your grace and your uh, goodness um, for us, Lord. And um, I pray for the little ones downstairs, that you can watch over them, that they can feel loved and cared for. Um, and Father, I just thank you for how much you love us. I thank you mm. for um, how gentle you are with us and, and for your faithfulness, Lord. Um, so just be with Ellen now, help to um, calm any nerves that she might have. And just, Father, I pray that you can help her to speak clearly the message that you've given her. Mm. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Today, we will begin actually diving into the Gospel of John, which is an account of the life of Jesus. We might call it a biography about Jesus. And as we get started, I want to ask you, if someone was to write your biography how, how would you want it to begin? Like, what would you want in the intro? You know, the intros to books are really important. They're meant to grab the reader, to provide kind of an appetizer for what's to come. And so how would you want the intro to your biography to begin? Would you want it to just be straight up facts? Ellen Mary Dykus grew up in the Midwest, went to faith-based schools from first to 12th grade, but really came to understand Jesus in college. Or would you want your intro to be a little bit more personal, maybe a bit more emotional, dramatic? Now, Ellie, or L, as her family knew her, she was a feisty little girl, kind of always clamoring for attention, the happy kid that liked to make people laugh. But she had secret insecurities that kept, she kept hidden and were stuck in her heart for many years. Maybe you finally would want your intro to be mysterious, maybe a little bit otherworldly. From a young age, Ellen wanted her life to count. And in her little girl dreams, she would think of faraway lands. Would she be able to serve and help people? Would her life really count? All of that was alongside her fantasies to become a rich professional athlete or a rock star. <laughs> Introductions are important in books. And I hope as you dove into John this week, that perhaps you noticed how unique his intro is compared to the other gospels. Listen into some snippets from Matthew 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then comes a long list of historical facts tying different people to the Messiah King from Mark 1 the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. John the Baptist appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. A dramatic beginning that kind of brings us right into the earthly part of the story with John, this messenger. Then from Luke 1, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely from time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, Luke was a true biographer. But then we get to John, and right out of the gates, he's drawing our attention elsewhere. Here's how he starts. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Then John pivots to present tense. 
the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. I mean, what is John doing here? This is dramatic. It seems otherworldly, kind of mysterious. It's, I thought, kind of like an impressionistic painting. What's John painting a picture of here? What's he about to reveal? Who is this word? He's saying he and him. He's not talking about just a vague supernatural force. He's talking about a person. And we know from the rest of scripture that that word is none other than Jesus Christ. And I like how the ESV study Bible says that all four gospels explain Jesus as the promised Messiah, the Christ, the God-man who was sent to fulfill the promise of salvation. But it goes on to say that Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the story from the earth up, kind of depicting a gradual unfolding of Jesus's unique relationship to the Father and, of course, their work together with the Spirit and salvation. But John, in his gospel, he's telling the story from heaven down, as we just read. Right out of the gates, we see God, our Creator and Savior, coming to earth, taking on human form and coming to us. So today, we're going to look at two of the key themes in our passage, verses 1 to 34. We're going to look at Jesus, our creator and savior, and then we're going to look at John the Baptist, the promised messenger who was born with one purpose, to prepare people's hearts for the creator and savior. So let's jump in. Jesus, our creator and savior. In those very first verses that I read, we're essentially taken from Genesis 1 in creation, then to Genesis 3 with the impact of sin, darkness, and darkness that has come into the world and into our hearts. But did you catch in our passage that there's some hints of hope? There's something that's pointing us forward, giving us the sense that the light has come and the darkness is not going to overcome the light. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. So let's dive in specifically to Jesus, our creator. In the beginning was the word, and there was nothing made that has not been made that wasn't made by this word. So in the beginning there, that echoes back to Genesis 1 and, of course, the creation of the world. Now, in the Old Testament, the word word is actually understood as God's um, powerful and effective action in creation, deliverance, and judgment. And you see that when you read it. It says, the word of the Lord came to this prophet. The word of the Lord did this amazing action. But John is using this in a radically different way. It's much more personal. He says, Jesus is the word. And we're going to see this all throughout our study this year, that in John, God's promises and means for fulfilling that creative word going out, it's not just a creative action. Now that that word is actually in Christ. He is the word. He is the creator. Paul affirms this in Colossians 1.16. Paul writes, speaking of Jesus, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. So knowing and trusting Jesus as creator is both really good news and it's also really humbling news. It's good because he created us with a design, with purpose, with value and identity, with belovedness, preciousness, that we can't lose. We can't add to it and we can't take away from it. But knowing Jesus as creator is also rightly humbling because it, it shows us that we are created by God for God. We don't belong to ourselves. The world and all who live in it exist for the Lord, our creator. This is humbling because it, it, it forces us to kind of reckon with that we don't have the power, the authority, or the responsibility, which is good news, to try to identify ourselves or recreate ourselves or to conjure up belovedness out of ourselves. 
I mean, we actually don't have that power, but this is humbling but good news because we're not left on our own to do this. So at the same time, bowing to Jesus as creator means none of us can plant a mine, me and my mine flag over any part of our life. There, no private real estate exists for the Christian. It's all for the Lord. But sisters, can you see how that's such good news that there's no struggle, there's no confusion, there's no heartbreak, there's no terror in your life where God leaves you on your own to deal with it. He's our creator and he's our loving Lord. And he has a vested interest in his beloved daughters and sons. Jesus is creator and he's also savior. So let's consider, you know, I don't know if you ever think about this. Like we would say, yeah, I need to be saved from sin, but what other words we put on? Like, what do we need to be saved from? What do we need escape from? What do we need deliverance from? I want to look at two key ideas that are right here in chapter one. That he saves us from darkness and he saves us from unbelief. Let's look at verses four to five and then 12 to 13. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So darkness, we're saved from darkness. Now, in the Bible, darkness can mean a few different things. It might mean literally uh, no sunlight, like the lights are out. It could also mean uh, something that's obscure or mysterious, like we can't figure it out. But here in John, it refers to sin and the utter corruption of brokenness that it, it has brought on literally every aspect of creation, our bodies, our minds, our relationships, um, the way the world works, government, re, I mean, uh, re relationships, weather, everything. We live in a sinful, broken world among sinful people, and we have our own sinful heart to deal with. And all of this works together to bring havoc, really, internally and externally. In a few weeks, we're going to look at a very famous verse that used to be posted a lot at uh, sporting events, John 3, 16. Now that passage, right after that verse, in verse uh, 19, it says pretty bluntly, the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. So blunt, so clear. And for those of us that were in study last year here, uh, we were in the book of Romans. And Romans also speaks to this right out of the start in chapter one, where uh, Paul is describing and saying all of creation testifies to God's existence. It, it's all out there. But listen to how what Paul says in Romans 121. For all they, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So darkened hearts and thinking uh, we might say that another way of looking at this is it's a refusing, it's a resisting of the light of God's truth and grace, of the word himself, Jesus, of our creator and savior. But Jesus has the power to save us from the darkness, but also from unbelief, which is a fruit of the darkness. Did you see in verses 10 and 11, it says the light came, the word came to his own people, but his people didn't know him. I mean, the Jews who had all the promises, they could not see, they would not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, in our, in our passage, in verses 31 and 33, John the Baptist says two times, he's giving testimony, and it says, I myself did not know him. I myself did not know him. What's he talking about? He's basically saying, 
hey, I grew up with this guy. Like we played together. We, we celebrated Shabbat together. But I, I didn't know, it wasn't revealed to me that this was actually, he was actually Messiah. He was the one I was born to proclaim. He needed his heart to be enlightened with the revelation of God's truth. He just didn't know. And God the Father opened up John's heart and mind so that he could say, you, you're the Lamb of God? Yeah, that's what God does for anyone that is seeking truth, seeking to know who God is. But the kind of unbelief that chapter one seems to be highlighting is more that unbelief that comes from a hardened heart, a resistance to bend our will to both believe and obey the Lord. And disobedience is a fist of rebellion towards our creator. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 says, take care brothers and sisters. If any of you, if, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day. That's good news. We were given to each other. Exhort each other every day. Encourage each other as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So once again, there's, there's treasure here for us to take into our hearts that's good news and humbling news. What's the good news of Jesus, our Savior, who saves us from unbelief? He has the power and is the truth, and he has the desire to save us from unbelief, to shine a light into our hearts and minds so that we understand who he is, that we can take hold of what is true in the scriptures, that we can believe and obey him, have our desires and our loves utterly changed. This fall is my 40th anniversary of having my eyes enlightened, the eyes of my heart enlightened. It was 40 years ago in October where things dropped down into my heart and I was like, oh, I've heard of you. I've read so much about you. I've studied about you. I've gone to church, but now I understand Jesus. That's very good news that God can do that, that he does that. But this is humbling too, because it shows us that we can't make ourselves or make anyone else believe the truth. We don't have that power. None of us is savior. So what's our hope? Our hope is Jesus Christ who has sent his spirit to save us and to open up our hearts to understand who he is. Here's how the apostle Paul prayed about this very thing and how we can pray for each other. Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. He prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. The word made flesh now dwells within us, and as image bearers, we have the linguistic ability and power to speak truth, to speak life-giving, transforming truth into each other's lives. I mean, how many of us, having been blind to sin or broken-hearted, bound up, paralyzed, are just confused? I mean, you were reading this or reading something, and you're like, I have no idea what this is talking about. And then you read it again, or then someone came to you and spoke words of truth, and your mind, your heart was, was opened up. You're like, oh, we have that amazing image-bearing power in us with our words to speak words of life and truth to each other. In John, uh, in, in our chapter, in verses 12 and 13, this is exactly, or this ties to what uh, John is actually saying about salvation itself, that it's given by God. 
It's not something that we can muscle our way into. Uh, it's not something that we're born into through our parents or church membership. It's not a spiritual experience that we conjure up for ourselves. It's nothing that spiritual gurus or church leaders can force upon us. It's a gift and right given through Jesus, our creator, savior, and Lord. The passage goes on to give a little bit more info about how he actually saves us. Later on, verses 16 and 17, it's talking about how God opens us up to his grace and truth, that Jesus is grace and truth. He came being those things and offering himself to us. So dare I say it one more time, this is good news and humbling news. It's amazing news because we have the truth of God revealed in Jesus, the word and the Holy Spirit sacred scriptures. God's not left us on his own like a geocache. You head on out there and you're going to find me somehow. No, I've come to you. I am here in the person of Jesus. And through the word, through the spirit within us and the scriptures, God's truth is to have a home in us. It's to be housed in us. That's what Colossians 3.16 is talking about, that the word of Christ would dwell in in you richly, Christ as person and the truth that we have in the word. So what's humbling about that? Well, we need to make room in our hearts and minds for the word of God. We might need to do some purging, some decluttering. We might need to do some examination. Are there voices, even spiritual sounding voices, which seem to kind of be uh, hinting or speaking things about Jesus that kind of rings a little bit true, but doesn't really map onto biblical faith? Uh, are we perhaps, like I've been seeing in my own life, just filled with so many good things that I'm too busy? There's a clutteredness. I am like literally right now in my life in a lot of different areas, I'm asking the Lord to kind of do some decluttering, to give me some fresh wisdom about what's he calling me to say yes to and what does that mean I need to say no to so that my desires and my priorities and my time will be solely focused on Christ. And yes, people, yes, relation, relationships, yes, delighting in life. But the Lord never wants us to be so filled with good things that our appetites for him are becoming dulled. So I would ask you, is the Lord's asking me, inviting me to, and humbling me, are there things that he would have us to put aside, maybe to fast from for the next month, maybe for this year, so that the word of God and Christ himself can be more at home in our hearts and minds? Jesus is creator and savior. So that leads us for the last bit of our time to look at John, this messenger what was some of his experience and what was his testimony? There's so much we could look at here, but I want to just kind of help us to consider what did God choose to reveal about this key person, this one person who was fulfillment of all these prophecies of a messenger being raised up, a voice in the wilderness, uh, crying out saying, make, make straight the way, the, uh, the way of the Lord. Uh, you can see those prophecies, uh, among other places, in Isaiah and Malachi. Look at Malachi, which is the last prophet, the last book right before the New Testament. And then it's quiet for 400 years before Jesus comes. And you'll see this prophecy of John. Well, when we put together all the Gospels, we learn a few things. First of all, I mean, he might have been seen as a weirdo. I mean, he lived in the desert. He wore a camel outfit. And he basically ate honey-dipped locust. But he was conceived miraculously to an elderly, barren couple. His mother, Elizabeth, was cousins with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And amazingly, Scripture says that John was filled with the Holy Spirit from conception. From conception, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And as I was thinking about this yesterday, it really hit me that in, in many ways... God began his ministry from the womb. Do you remember that when Mary, now having conceived Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, goes to visit Elizabeth, 
She's in her fifth or sixth month, which as the mamas know, babies are around the size of a sweet potato and they begin kicking at that time. Elizabeth says, whoa, like the baby within me leaped for joy. John was leaping for joy as a six month baby, six month in the womb baby at the very presence of Jesus and in the presence of Mary. I would so encourage you to take some time and, and read Luke 1 over the next week if you can. It's a long chapter, but it has so many rich details that we don't have time to cover about these things. But again, in our passage, we see how John gave witness to Jesus. He was courageous. He was humble. And he was, he was direct. And he was always pointing away from himself. As we'll see in uh, John 3, he was always decreasing that Jesus would increase. He, was, he consistently said, I'm not him. I'm not the savior. Look over here. I'm not the prophet. I'm not Elijah raised from the dead. No, look here. Look at him. He's the lamb of God. He's the fulfillment of all the promises that we've been taught. So you think, wow, what a great, bold prophet. Well, there's encouragement for us in John, in his story for when our faith is wobbly or we're confused. Maybe you know this story from when John was in prison in Matthew 11. He's very close to uh, basically being killed for his faith, for his allegiance to Jesus. So he's hunkered down probably in this dark prison cell. And it says in verse 2, When John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples to Jesus, and they said to him on behalf of John, Jesus, are you the one to come, or should we be waiting for someone else? And Jesus sends word back to him and effectively says, John, yeah, look at all the signs. Look at what's happening. I am the one. So when we're wobbly, when we're confused, the Lord will come to us and give that assurance through his word and the words of life spoken through each other. Now, as we close up, I want to just highlight one other thing that kind of ties into that, that might not be as obvious. And that is in both of these men, John, the beloved disciple and John, the Baptist, we have, I think, really tender examples of how God provides people alongside of us to help us to help us grow, to point, um, to help point us as we point and point each other and saying, look at him. I'll help you look at him. Or we go to each other and say, I need help. Like, I don't know what I believe anymore. Like, I don't even know if I would call myself a Christian anymore. Would you help me? Help me learn more about who Jesus is. And one of the ways we do this, and this goes back to the hints of hope, in the very first verses where John says, the light will not be overcome by the darkness. We remind each other that this life is not all there is. I like the way that Karen Hodge, the director of women's ministry for the PCA, she's kind of always exhorting and encouraging, don't live for the dot. Your little, your one life, your life here, live for the line, live for eternity. And we help each other. We remind each other this life isn't all there is. That there's another world we're waiting for. That the word, creator, savior, is also going to be coming again as warrior king. Listen to what Revelation 19, how it describes Jesus. And this is John. He's writing this again later in his life. Describes Jesus as the king coming on a white horse. A king whose name is not only faithful and true, but listen to how verses 13 and 16 describe Jesus. The name by which he is called is the word of God. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is our word, the word of God in Jesus. He's creator and Savior. And as Robert Yarbrough explains, believing in Jesus, quote, 
it, it's not a thing. It's not a lifeless object, a static attitude of passive agreement and acceptance. No, believing in Jesus, believing in the word of the word of God made flesh, it's a dynamic posture and activity, a, a living devotion. He goes on to say, to believe in the name of Jesus means to enter into an all-encompassing, life-transforming relationship with the God whom Jesus has come to disclose. Now that all-encompassing, life-transforming relationship, sisters, that's, that's a lifetime of walking it out one day at a time, one struggle at a time, one joy at a time. And he doesn't leave us alone to do that. He gives us each other. This is a stated goal and purpose of women's Bible study, that you hear the word taught here, and then we go into our groups and we're texting or meeting up throughout the week to say, to encourage each other, hold fast. Let me encourage you. I need encouragement. Would you help me? There's a lot at stake here, but it makes sense that Jesus, the word creator and Lord, would touch every part of our lives. And he uses us to be a part of that process. So let's pray and close up and ask for his help. Lord, we look to you. Word, creator, savior, bread of life, the way, truth, and life, the door, the light of the world, the great shepherd of the sheep, the true vine, and so much more. Lord, open our hearts and minds to understand you, to believe you, to have desires to obey you. Help us know how to help each other and to encourage each other, Lord, to keep looking to you, that we're going to make it to the end, Lord. We're going to finish that finish. We're going to get to that finish line and be with you forever. Keep us faithful, Lord, until that time for your glory and for our good. Amen.